Hi there, everyone. It's Lindsay LaPaquette here, workplace communication expert. Uh, and I'm going to be joined today in just a moment by Joanne Marlowe, who's going to be talking to us about rebuilding your business with the best people. I know that a lot of businesses have been struggling immensely through COVID and continue to struggle. And you may not be ready yet at that point where you're looking to rebuild, but we wanted to give you some time to reflect on what Joanne is sharing here today about how to go about that rebuilding process so that once you're ready, you can do so with the best people on your team. And so I'm just gonna share um, Joanne's bio. Joanne is known as an employee retention specialist. She works with small business owners who are frustrated when their best employees leave causing challenges in productivity, morale, time, and money. She's a professional speaker, certified life coach, and international best-selling author of over 15 books and articles. Businesses who work with Joanne find that they can create loyal employees who feel valued, challenged, and recognized with purposeful work. So I'm gonna invite, jo uh, invite Joanne to join, that's a bit of a tongue twister, so thanks, Joanne, for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks, Lindsay. It's always a pleasure to be with you. It's always lovely to speak with you also. So I'd love to hear from anyone listening. Uh, just make sure that you can see us live. I see us in the stream. But if you can just drop in the chat uh, that you're here and where you're listening from. And as always, if you have questions from jo for Joanne, um, you can leave those in the chat and we'll answer them as we go along. Uh, Joanne, maybe we can start by having you share um, some of the challenges that you've been seeing businesses and particularly in your area of expertise with small businesses, what they've been experiencing lately through the pandemic. Well, through the pandemic, it's a matter of, well, I hate to say this, but a lot of people are saying, I don't want to go to work. If the government's going to pay me a, a little bit to survive, uh, that'll do. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things. There's a shortage of workers right now, believe it or not. And um, employers are finding that their time is so valuable. They really are just not interviewing or doing um, reference checks in, in, uh, to, to make sure that that's the best candidate. They're just mm -hmm. saying, okay, they have the experience. Okay, they'll do. And they start and then within weeks or maybe a month, um, that person is, is, you know, not happy with the job for some reason and leaves and then the cycle begins again. So the mm. small business employer is just, you know, they're trying to do their job. They're trying to get things back on, on <laughs> well, never normal again, but they're trying to get things going again um, at, at a better speed. And yet employee, employees and employment is a real problem for them. Mm. So this this issue that you're talking about about people not necessarily doing reference checks and taking as long as long with candidates it, uh, is what you're, I'm understanding from you is that that has heightened or gotten worse than through the pandemic because of how tight people's time is or has this kind of always been a challenge? I think it's always been a challenge, but now you know it seems to be the only way. Um, you know, some companies are spending a lot of money, sometimes 15 to 25 percent of an employee's annual salary in order to have an agency hire them. That's that can be a fortune for them, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it does save them time. It takes at least 20 to 30 hours to find a good recruit. And um, and then, of course, you and, and then you've got to train them and introduce them, do the onboarding and everything. So it's a very, very time consuming process with no guarantees. Right. And so I hadn't really ever crossed my mind what you were saying about um, people wanting to stay on the CERB, the CERB instead of working and how that's affecting uh, small business owners until I started speaking to a few who are telling me that they're exactly experiencing those challenges that um, they're having a hard time, you know, in certain domains, I know there's a surge of work, and yet they can't find people, which was a bit ironic to me, I hadn't um, anticipated that. So I'm curious if anyone's listening, uh, if you're finding that in your business, that you're having a hard time uh, filling those positions and uh, filling them with people who are, who are staying. Um, Joanne, I'm curious then with with the CERB you know, most likely running out very, very soon uh, for anyone who started on it right off in March. How do you think that's going to affect uh, the dynamic going forward? Well, you know, like uh, the 
pandemic swept in and it was a shock for everybody, I think they're going to find it's a shock if they haven't already started looking for work. Hmm. So um, for those employees who, you know, many of them have decided, you know, that job I had, eh, I just don't want to go back to it. It wasn't my cup of tea. And, um, and employers likewise are saying, okay, I've had a little time to decompress a bit and rethink things, those those who are actually doing that. And they're asking questions like, well, who do I want to bring back? And what legal ramifications are involved if I don't bring her and him or those people back? Because mm-hmm. there are legal ramifications, if especially mm-hmm. if they were laid off and promised work later. Right. And, and I guess this, this time away maybe has given some, you know, I find sometimes when you step back from a situation, you start to see things that weren't so clear when you were caught up in the in the craziness of it. And um, what I'm kind of understanding from you, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, that step back now from having to uh, have furloughed people or, you know, made different decisions in the businesses has given that step away for people to have that time to reevaluate what is necessary in my in my business, what was working, who is necessary. There's of course financial pressures leading those decisions, but beyond the financial piece, I think there's that whole piece of just looking at, was that working in the first place that's that's affecting the dynamic? Is 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 that what I'm understanding? Yeah, that's a, a really good point, Lindsay. Um, many companies, as as we know, are repivoting or they're pivoting their business to say, what else can we do right. that that's not going to exist anymore. But, you know, the small business owner is really suffering and a huge percentage may never come back again. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. those those owners may just take a look and say, OK, what else can I do? They may come back into the workplace for a while, but not happily. I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Or they may join with another company that is thriving even yeah. during this pandemic. But, you know, the story I love to share, and it's I can make it really brief, is, you know, a little story that, um, you know, you're on your way to work and it's a great day and you're happy and you're driving and you turn a corner and all of a sudden you see all of your staff standing out on the road. And as you get closer, you see your entire business up in flames. I liken that to COVID. Hmm. And then here you are looking at this business and you're going, okay, everybody's safe, but Oh my God, it, my business is just burnt to the ground. What am I going to do? And, you know, it seems really hopeless. And then, uh, you know, miraculously, ideally, you turn around and there's this fabulous building that's up for lease uh, right across the street. But the thing that I always recommend is you, before you go lunging into a new start, you have to sit down and say, okay, who am I going to be now? What are what is my real purpose? And I like to get, say, what is my north star? What's going to give me the direction that I need so that I never get off course? And I'm always going to follow that north star. So it's not a vision; it's a purpose. You need to know why you're existing and what role you are playing in society, the community, the economy, and with your employees. And once you've determined that, then you need to ask a few more questions. Okay, now that I know that, who do I want to bring on board with me? And Mm -hmm. who do I want to leave behind? What relationships do I want to carry on? And what do I no longer need in my life? Those are just a few of the questions, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, you almost have to think, okay, if I'm starting over, and even if you're not starting over, but you've not done that process, I really highly recommend that you take a pause and because i look at that as the foundation you need to know who you are where your north star is and then you look okay i've got my purpose you can then build on your vision your mission your goals for the company and then make sure that everyone eventually everyone in your business is fully aligned with those with that north star of yours Mm. and once you've got them on board it's much, much easier to get them engaged. Yeah, there's there's so much in what you've been saying that I'd like to unpack because um, I, I think there's a lot of value in, in, in everything you're saying. And I'm curious to hear from people watching if, if they've had those moments of reflecting on, you know, was I in business? 
related to my true passion and, and to my true purpose. Because as I was listening to you, I thought, well, if my business were to burn down today, although it's a service business, there's not a lot that could burn. Uh, but, you know, let's say something were to happen to me during a period of time. Would I rebuild something? No. And my answer today is no, because I think I, I am fairly aligned with my purpose. But when I go back 10 years ago or five years ago, when my, my mom and uncle passed, as you know, um, that was my COVID. That was my time to step back and reflect on. I was very clear on what my purpose was, but the roles I was in weren't aligning me to it. And I always felt this friction. I was always fighting against it because I wanted to stay aligned to my purpose, but I, I was in a system that that I it was hard to, to do that. Um, and so that was the step for me to step back and, and realign with my purpose. And it's interesting what you say that for some people now, the, the work is realigning their purpose. For some people, it's looking at, and I'm not going to get your words exactly right here, but um, are, are the actions I'm taking aligned with my purpose? For some people, it's do I have the right people to align to that purpose? And are are we all aligned in the right direction? And I think um, this, this pandemic has given a lot of, of that space maybe for us to deal with some of the stuff that I think often we didn't actually want to see. You know, we kind of, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think often there's that sense that that something's off, you know, we're not fully happy or, uh, but we're not quite ready yet to take that step to look at, am, am I going to do things differently? And COVID, I think in many respects has forced that uh, upon a lot of, a lot of people. And so maybe we can start with purpose. So for someone who is realizing through this, you know, either they've shut down their business or they're in the process of reflecting on it. Um, how, how does somebody know if they're aligned to their purpose? I think, you know, for many, it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, something that uh, truly excites them, gives them joy. They can maybe even use the word passionate about, but it also has to be something that is worthwhile to the client or to mm -hmm. somebody who's going to support that business with their money. So, you know, if it's, uh, you know, I'm going to train a teetsy fly to do circles in a hula hoop, uh, not much of a market for that. So you always have to make sure that alignment word is huge because you may have a passion, but is it in demand by the public or by your ideal client? So um, taking a really good look at things that when you do even a small activity and you think, oh, this is great. You know, you might be discovering something new or you um, might find a new hobby that you just absolutely love. And then you start thinking, hmm, can I use this to help somebody else? Um, so in business, you're always in business typically, not just to serve yourself and your employees, but to serve a greater good with helping other companies or suppliers or and um, the clients, your, your public. So, you know, they have to, they have to mesh and, and have something that's in common, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that's important. So how does the pressure of the pandemic fit into this or, or not just the pandemic, but you know, the financial pressures that small businesses, well, beyond small businesses that many people are facing, because what I observed um, right as the pandemic hit was just panic, right? Pa panic, scrambling, like it, it felt like a very, and I understand why, but a very reactive response of, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And and it was, um, so I was on vacation when the pandemic hit. So I, I was totally out of, you know, the mode of thinking about my business and the impact on my business. And so I, I sort of had this bird's eye view before I got back to work and had to start thinking about, um, what I was going to do uh, of the reactions around. Um, and so what's the, re what's the link there? Or what impact do you see of the stress that people are under in terms of their ability to connect with their purpose? Is it facilitating it? Does it make it harder? What are you, what are you seeing? Well, I, uh, for, for sure, you know, it's not just employees or people in general that are f feeling so much more stress but there's a lot of fear built into this, you know, and, and employers, especially, you know, when they've had to close their doors and then board up their windows, that, that is 
that is like a death that they have to grieve, even yeah. because you don't have a crystal ball. We have no real idea of when, when we're all going to go back into a, a place where we can see each other, touch each other, take off our masks and go, woohoo. You know, we just don't know what that's going to be like. We get all kinds of rumors. It's going to take years, maybe, you know, or, or maybe by Christmas we'll all be able to fly across Canada or into the United States. And others are saying, there's no way I'm getting on a plane. And others are saying, yeah, big deal. So, you know, there's, there's no way of knowing. And that builds a lot of fear. Mm hmm and, yeah. worry, and worry. And certainly in talking to some of my colleagues who are psychologists, they've never been busier. You know, yeah. they, they are supporting, they are just, you know, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m., they are talking to people and guiding them through the stress and, mm. and everything else. And, you know, we've got, um, we've got life happening no matter what. But the yeah. finances, that is really difficult. Uh, the government um, in, in North America has, has come up with some safety measures for us, and, and, uh, but we're also going to have to get creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, like you, I was away on vacation, and there was no mention of COVID in Mexico when I was there in March, early March. Came back to what seemed like a ghost town in Vancouver. <laughs> that was my experience, too. Where is everybody? <laughs> It was, it was an odd uh, space to be in, eh? It, it was. Yeah. And then, you know, quarantine for, for two weeks. You mean I have to order my groceries? Where am I going to get that <laughs> from? <laughs> so, yeah. and and in my business, I was, you know, I had speaking engagements all planned. Well, you're on the stage or you're in their business. Well, no longer. Yeah. So literally something that was planned for an entire year just went. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and then I was thinking, okay, better get really good with Zoom. And then I thought, well, you know, 400, 1,500 people aren't going to all want to be on Zoom. Everyone was learning all over again. And that's another stressor for employees. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I think what you're saying about grief, particularly, and the additional stressors on people, especially businesses that are that have had to close, you know, I've seen some of those businesses that you've known for years and years. Oh yeah. My heart goes out to them because I can't imagine pouring your life into something. And, and the, the way in which COVID happens too. So the parallel I was making again was through, you know, losing my, my family members in an accident and that, that loss of sense of control, right? You, it wasn't a decision you made. It wasn't a misstep you made. It was just this thing that happened that knocks you off your feet and changes your world. And so I think that grief process is really important. Um, and, and like you said, for people to have this space to to process that before moving forward with further decisions, I think brings people to a, to more sound decisions, although I understand where stress um, makes that challenging. But I, I'd like to leave some space to have you guide us a bit, Joanne, on as people are getting ready to do that. And I know, I know that a lot of people may not yet be in that space where they're ready to start rebuilding. But as, as time goes on, as they process their grief of the loss of their business or just the challenges and the changes of their business, um, as people start to rebuild, I'd like to talk a bit about how to do so with, with the best people, how to get people set up in a way that will make their businesses as successful as possible. Because I think we are going to have a few tough years uh, ahead of us still. And, and if there's anyone watching, you have specific questions about as you're rebuilding your business, you're rebuilding your team, uh, how to do so, please use the chat and I will um, make sure that Joanne answers your question. Uh, but yeah, Joanne, can you give us some tips when when people are ready about how to determine, maybe first determine who is, who's are the best fits? Or is that would that be the first step? No, actually, it's not. But, okay. well, but so you tell me the first step. Then. <laughs> just as if you were building a, a home, you have to have a really solid foundation, and so you're not going to, you know, build it with sticks and stones these days. You have to build something solid mm -hmm. so that you can build a bigger business, a bigger home on top of that foundation. So, in my mind, anyway, and and with my clients, I, I. 
guide them through this entire process. And like I said, you start off with what is your North Star? What's your purpose? And, and right. sometimes you can just start with that, you know, if you're in a quiet time. And I really recommend if that you leave your premise. No kids, no, no spouses, partners, no dogs. Just I second go, that. <laughs> go to a park, go to your favorite, you know, maybe there's a stream and take your lawn chair and just sit with a book and write. And and just brainstorm. What are some of the things that give you a lot of joy? that could be marketable mm -hmm. and you know that'll pump you maybe with some brainstorming there's no right or wrong answer to brainstorming but that gives you something at least to say okay these are the things that make me happy are they marketable can they be marketable mm -hmm. so that's a you know each of those need to be researched obviously yeah. but then and then once you determine what you're going to do and you have a purpose like mine is to change some ugly statistics that I learned when I was just a young adult, that eight out of 10 employees are unhappy in their workplace. And I'm going, are you kidding me? How does that happen? I was teaching at the time, writing my own curriculum. I was having a ball. Nobody told me what to do. They just said, go for it, Joanne, and have fun. And we did. And um, so I didn't have any problems with staff or, or administration at that time, I was living my passion. So, you know, um, I have always been a great educator. I've loved it. I have tons of energy engaging people when I do that. So that is my passion. And all through the years, I've retired from teaching now, but all through the years, there's always been that theme. I have to teach or I have to train others. And I've looked at, I've tried lots of different ways that I can actually use those strengths of mine. Um, and even to fine tooth, to, to get more detail, um, Strength Finder 2.0 by Tom Roth is a fabulous book. Um, and when you buy the book, you can do an assessment uh, with a code in the back. And then, then all of a sudden you go, yeah, no wonder I like that instead of this. Mm. And um, you can start saying, okay, how can I use those skills? How can I use those strengths and behaviors that really are important to me and build another business? Mm -hmm. So first thing, find your purpose. Um, the next, and I don't want to give all my secrets away, but by having that, you can then, you know, what are your big juicy goals? You know, like be a big visionary like Disney was back in the day. You know, he didn't want to just draw a mouse and say, go for it, uh, Mickey. He, he, he had this huge vision. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned Disney because it's absolutely my very favorite place on earth. So um, and I love the way they they have built a vision. Mm -hmm. So once you've built that vision, the other thing you need to think about is, What's really important to you? Mm -hmm. What's what kind of characteristics, what values are really important to you that you can embody in your company and also with all of your employees? So those core values are really important. And when I'm teaching my programs, it's basically, you know, your core programs are absolutely these must be um, solid. And every single manager, every single employee must be competent and and demonstrate those same core values. Mm. They're not going to be, they won't stay with you because there's no alignment. Right. Right. You want yeah. to bring in people like yourself, not identical, just, you know, the same belief system. Right. So that's part of the foundation. and And that is key because once you know, what type of people you want and the attitudes and behaviors that they bring to the office. Mm -hmm. Then you can start building your job descriptions with that same material. Mm -hmm. You can figure out, um, you know, you, you're, and when you're advertising, that's another thing too. You know, when I, um, some of my smaller and really busy um, uh, clients don't have time, don't have the 20 or 30 hours. And so, you know, in some cases I'll go and I'll do the recruiting for them. 
but I have a really good conversation with them first and get a real feel for the company because I'm going to promote their company. Just like, you know, you, this is going to be an ideal place. And if, if you are a good fit, these are the qualities you're going to have, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I interview them on the same sort of basis. And again, interview questions are very unique. I've studied and, and practiced different kinds of interview questions that don't just say, so tell me about yourself. You know, that's such a drag. I mean, it might be a good opener, but, you know, it's it. instead you could say, tell me about the best job you've ever had and why. What mm -hmm. a great opener that could be. Or tell me about the best experience you've ever had and what made it so exciting to you. Mm -hmm. because the employer will then get a really good idea of what's not on their resume. Mm -hmm. I look yeah. at an employee like a big iceberg. All the employee usually sees that is the top above the water and that would be their skills and their experience mm -hmm. and maybe a few of their strengths. But underneath is how they get along with people or not. Mm -hmm. um, their attitudes toward big business or not, or little business. Um, it, it talks about their behaviors and their respect for others. That's that the whole person needs to be interviewed, not mm. just the top of the iceberg. Yeah. So when, when you say that, um, you know, I think in my business, one of one of my biggest values is inclusion. And, you know, and with that comes, you know, accepting people with accepting people's differences and accepting yeah. people who they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Diversity. And so for me, that would be a deal breaker. If I was hiring employees and I got the sense that there was any um sense of superiority you know they think they're thinking they're better than someone else whether that is you know a diversity issue in terms of male female or race or sexuality or anything or just in terms of this other person doesn't matter to me because it's very important to me that people be treated equally regardless of if they're the janitor in the building or the ceo and so Hiring for values is different than skills, as you're saying, where that doesn't mean that my business needs somebody who's very creative and somebody who's more process oriented and, and structured. And those are very different skill sets, but the, the, their, the underlying values um, are the same. And I, I think in my, my career history as an employee, that's sometimes where I, I bumped heads because I'm I think pretty firm in my values. And I think I have been, I, ne I haven't necessarily been able to verbalize them as clearly as I, I can nowadays, but I knew what I needed to stand up for and speak up about um, from a young age, my parents would say. And, <laughs> um, and I think, I think where I would bump heads a lot would be, we'd be talking about the issues, but really what was, what, where our our conflict was coming from was that our values were different and that's not what we were speaking about. So we couldn't really resolve it. So I completely understand why you're saying that that's the first step to hiring. Well, is figuring out what your company stands for and, and what, what those values are that are absolute deal breakers. Um, and I think there are a lot of businesses that don't, don't have that necessarily figured out. And I would even wager to say that with COVID um, there's some shifting of values going on. People becoming aware that, 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 you know, their lifestyles and their businesses were not aligned. You know, I've heard so many people say to me, um, I realized that I was living this life of constantly running and, and it's kind of the realizations I had when my parents passed was, wow, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, life is short. Why am I living this life by yeah. choice, by choice? And so I think it's important for people to do that work now as they're exploring um, is, is this, is this what I actually want moving forward? It's kind of a, I won't say a perfect time because I know it's not a perfect time for so many and I don't want to no. uh, minimize what people are going through, but it does open the door for people to reflect on, um, what, what truly matters to them. Yeah. And, you know, um, employers are, well, everybody, you know, has had more time with family, more time at home. Um, they've, they've realized that uh, there are better communication methods than maybe they've previously used. Um, their tolerance is, is better. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, I've noticed certainly people are kinder. 
Mm. You know, they're, although I've well, seen, both extremes, I would say. I've seen both. I've seen yeah, some kind of I, say, although, I certainly recall a, a few <laughs> public instances where I'm going, <laughs> holy crow, did you say that out loud? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're under like, a lot of stress. <laughs> well, that's right. The thing is, is we don't know what is going on yeah. in anybody's life. Yeah. And unless we actually have good conversations to get to know our employees or for our employees to get to know um, what's happening with their employer, you know, open communication, especially with the younger generations. And I can say that because I'm an older generation, but um, a younger generation, the millennials now are 24 to around 40 years of age, give or take, um, who you, uh, you know, research. But the thing is, is that, you know, one in three employees are millennials right now. And by 2025, wow. Um, the largest population of millennials and Gen Zs, who are now 16 to 24, um, that's going to be the largest population in the world. So mm -hmm. boomers and Gen Xs are just going to fade into old age gracefully, I hope. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, and, and, um, and Gen Z and, and millennials are totally different. Their behaviors, their upbringing, totally different. Mm -hmm. um, but still, open communication, expectations from the employer and discussing, you know, this is, these are our, our boundaries and mm -hmm. this is, these are the consequences if you break those boundaries and making sure that everything's clear. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting employers who say, Joanne, I, I need a, a, a new staff member. He said, I got a text at 11 o'clock at night from my new millennial sorry, millennials, um, you know, it's not all of you. Um, it's just the odd few and getting a text saying, yeah, not going to come back anymore. <laughs> I've had it happen, unfortunately, <laughs> in my business. Yeah. Yeah. So is part of what you're doing then during the hiring process as you're, as you're assisting small businesses to, to find the right people, helping them set those clear expectations on both ends? Because I see that's where things go wrong a lot is that, and I, ha I recently had this with somebody that I had contracted out to even where I thought expectations were clear. I'm going to guess she thought they were clear too. But then as we started working together, it became very clear that it wasn't clear that we didn't have the same definition of our expectations. Mm -hmm. And I um, tried to clarify that, didn't get very far. And we ended up, I ended up deciding to stop working with her. At the core of it, I do think it was, there were a few other factors, but I think there was a mismatch in terms of what our expectations were. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's three months of time and money I invested into setting this up. And as you know, the setup phase is always longer and more costly and, and so be it, life happens. But um, so is part of what you're doing bringing that help to small businesses to help them clarify as they're hiring on a new empl employee what the expectations are. So there's fewer surprises down the line when someone realizes, Hey, this isn't what I thought I was signing up for. I'm out of here. Yeah. I wouldn't say I'm a retention specialist unless I was. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, and, and what I really focus on is you can hire, right. Yeah. And, and retention is, is not a big issue anymore. Um, so the, the very first step, and I have a three step system, I guess, that I go through. And, and always the first one is I do an organizational assessment. And within that assessment, if I find out that the employer is just up to their eyebrows in work, just doing what they do and getting business and everything else, they don't have that 20 or 30 hours to go and hunt mm -hmm. for the best one. So um, I'll take on that as a, a small part of their the solution that I provide for them. And um, you know, typically uh, go through that whole process on my own and find them at least three best candidates and they choose. And, you know, there's a whole process I go through that. But the fact that, you know, I work from my home office, um, I don't have, I'm not a cookie cutter recruiter. And I don't look at recruiting as my only job, that's for sure. But it is part of the assessment and the solution to the assessment. Um, you know, I go in and I find out why are people leaving in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the issues? And I interview the staff and I interview the management team. And 
you know, as a coach, I am bound to confidentiality. So even though they won't tell the boss why they're leaving or why they're unhappy and they yeah. won't, um, they keep pretty silent. <laughs> they tell me oh, everything. They tell a stranger who they trust. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> Go I've, to the you trust, yep. <laughs> I've had people in tears. I've people saying, yeah. oh, thank goodness I can finally talk to somebody. And, you know, it makes me feel lovely. But on the other side, when I'm reporting back to the owner or the CEO, they say, who said that? And I said, well, mm. let me tell you this. More than one person is concerned about this situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then I propose a solution. And then, of course, the next step is to um, implement the solution. Mm -hmm. And that can take months, depending on the team. Yeah. You know, I, I, certainly, I'm always willing to, I don't want to try and turn a whale around. The whale has to have good flippers and fins to begin with and yeah. a tail that'll say, oh, I'm being moved <laughs> and willing to move. You know, mm -hmm. someone who wants to change, someone who sees that big picture or the, at least that light at the end of the tunnel and needs the guidance and support, that's what I can do for them and get them on a solid foundation um, and, and avoid all the reasons. Sometimes it means changing your character a little bit, you yeah. know, like saying, thank you for being here or, um, wow, that report was excellent because other employers, <laughs> there's one that's known as the stoplight boss. And his assistant has three signs. And depending on his mood, <laughs> if it's a red sign, you don't even go near his office. If it's yellow, yeah, you may want to book again another day. If it's green, he's in a good mood, go ahead. So even though you've got an appointment with him, this this guy is, you know, known as the stoplight boss. Um, right. Others just don't realize that. Their personality is hurt, and and you know I'm I have a really high emotional quotient, so I thought everybody did until I found out they didn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know sometimes those who are really straightforward say exactly what they mean. They they don't realize they're hurting somebody else's feelings. So that's why getting to know your employees, know what makes them tick, that's part of the process too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of power in understanding everyone's nuances. And like you said, so I don't know if I see it so much as changing character, but but being able to learn new skills, you know, that that um, that may not be second nature. So I'm somebody, believe it or not, uh, you may believe this, you know me, I think fairly well, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty directive usually, especially when I'm stressed. I'm very much the person who's like, hey, I need this by this time. Um, works very well because my assistant that's kind of her style and so she just doesn't bother her but I have to be very careful when I work with somebody who who does not like that style to make sure sometimes I type out when I'm really busy my email of what I you know what I need and where the project is going and I then I go back to the top and remind myself oh I gotta say something relational and I'm very relational but when I'm busy I'm focused I'm very task oriented I'm like that and, yeah. And so the crunch skills that can be boom, learned. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. I've learned that when I do boom, 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 then it's not going to necessarily get done because the person's irritated <laughs> at me, you know? So yeah, that's uh, true. It's, right. yeah. They may all, you know, the people you hire may have all the skills and strengths you could possibly dream of. They have the core values, but they have a different personality. And, totally. and so that's why, like I said, that whole iceberg has to be, yeah checked out you have to you know i have questions that you need to ask and mm -hmm. um i've covered a lot of that in my in my book and um i'm doing a lot of reports and stuff like that to to help the small business person you know learn a couple of tips that are going mm -hmm. to help them to uh to feel better about moving forward more yeah. confident in, in being profitable again so can you share the name of your book for anyone who's who's watching and interested in Oh thanks. In sure. So it's it's on Amazon and it's called 25 Powerful Strategies to Hire and Successfully Retain Millennials. Perfect. So even if you looked up Joanne Marlowe, you'd probably find that book there. 
And um, it's, it's been a bestseller down the States as well as in Canada, especially for HR. So it talks about all the generations and how to deal with them and why they are like they are. And, awesome. um, and then focuses on the millennials for sure. That's great. Well, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'll just give another couple of minutes uh, in the chat if anyone has any questions for Joanne. Uh, Joanne, I know you've recently uh, written also um, a new white paper, I believe, if you'd love to share the like to share the name of that also so people can find it. Sure. It's uh, it's more of an article than it is a white paper. Okay. But, um, it's you know, as I mentioned, though, so many people will never tell you the truth, not even when they're exiting during an exit interview. They won't tell you yeah. why they're leaving. Um, they'll not say it to your face, you, you're a crap. They still want a reference, right? Yeah. Or, <laughs> or at least, you know, they 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 want to save face. They don't want to insult the person that hired them for a number of years. So this is three unspoken reasons why your best employees leave. And um, you can find that on my website. Um, I'll be, and it's certainly free for you to download. And it's joannemarlow.com. So. so there's Joanne's website. Uh, you can find that there if you'd like to take a peek at that or, or connect with Joanne. Uh, Joanne, in terms of social media, if people want to find you, where is the best, where are you the most active that people should follow? On LinkedIn, actually, I'm very active. Again, it's under Joanne Marlowe, so uh, I'm easy to find. Um, I'm doing a lot of uh, little blurbs now. I've recently gone, I've changed from a business name to my full name. It's just a lot easier than a big mouthful that I had before. So uh, Joanne Marlowe um, is me. And same with my email, it's joanne at joannemarlow.com. So I've kept it simple. Um, I'm a solopreneur that's gone through the same kinds of hiccups that a lot of you have gone through. I've hired people. I've been on both sides where I've been a manager of a large organization and a um, division, and I've been an employee. And I've seen remarkable changes as, as a result of what I'm practicing now um, and doing now and uh, learned some great lessons along the way. And, you know, I've also learned that people don't need to tolerate um, being, uh, you know, with abuse that they're getting. They have mm -hmm. to, they have to use their voice and speak up. Mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, you'll see on my website too, that uh, I invite all of you for a 30 minute complimentary chat if you just want to complain <laughs> listen and uh, or you have some specific questions about um, your needs or what's next for you I'm happy to chat with you and come up with some ideas that you can take away I love that so you can jot that down uh, Joanne's address here and I just wanted to add that uh, Joanne, uh, we recently published an episode on the Workplace Communication Podcast with Joanne, which is about hiring the right people. And so you can take a look at that at this link here, lindsaylapaquette.com forward slash podcast. You'll find all the episodes of the podcast there. And if you scroll down a bit uh, to Joanne's, I... I think you were number four or five. She was one of my one of my guinea pigs. So thank you, Joanne, <laughs> for for doing that. And lots of great info in that episode from Joanne about uh, some of the questions to ask and again how to get into the process of making sure that you're hiring the right people so that you retain them and save all that money that 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 turnover is costing you. Hundreds so, of thousands of yeah. dollars can be saved. Yeah, hundreds I of thousands. Doubt it. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Um, Outrageous. About 6% of a company's income is spent just on replacing staff. Wow. Which I think nowadays more than ever are costs that people are really wanting to rein in because I know budgets are, are tighter than they were six to eight months ago. That's so right. I'd invite you to reach out to Joanne. Uh, again, I'll put her, her uh, website up here, joannemarlow.com. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Joanne, thank you, of course, for for joining me on LinkedIn Live. And uh, stay tuned. Next week, we'll be back uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. with Kristen Harcourt. We'll be talking about topics related to emotional intelligence. So have a great week, everyone. And thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been awesome to talk to you and your followers. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.